Welcome to that 80s show. It is way too late to press eject. <laughs> you cannot pop that cassette out of the cassette player. Welcome to another week back in the 80s. Hello, Dory. How are you? Well, now I'm thinking about all the times that my cassettes got stuck in my ghetto blaster and it was so sad. And then when I eventually got them out, they were like, Broken. Oh, God, I hated that so much. It was so traumatic. All this trauma we went through, Paolo. How are we okay? You know, I, I think like I watch I watch kids now and their biggest problem is like, I think this is why we could be so good at troubleshooting tech problems, our generation. <laughs> yeah. Because like we had tech problems. Boy, did we have tech oh, problems. Oh my God, did we have, because like a lot of new tech came out in the 80s. Yeah. You had hi-fis, you had computers, you had video game consoles, like all new. Mm. They came out, nobody knew, they weren't perfected. Yeah. And we had to like figure it out. I mean, how many times did you not just blow the dust out of your Nintendo cartridge your, or golden china more likely? I mean, I, I cannot relate to that metaphor, but the amount of times that I was fighting with my ghetto blaster over things or the VCR as well. Oh my God, the VCR. Oh, my, my Sony Walkman, my, my famous yellow Sony Walkman. I was the only person that I think in my family, like some people go like, oh, this is the first person in the family to get a degree. <laughs> no, I was the first person in the whole family to figure out how to set the time on the video recorder. Oh, uh, yeah. I was Another definitely was the first 12. person to to figure that out. Well, I mean, I'm, I, am the, I am the only child. Mm -hmm. And yes, I was, I'm trying to think how old I was when we got the first video machine. I was probably eight or nine when we got our first yeah. video machine. So it was still it was still in the eighties. Did did um and, and I mean this is something here, right? Wood. Wood was they just thought wood on appliances and tech <laughs> like was great, right? Wooden TVs, wood did you have wood on your video machine? No, we didn't. Why do they think they were so good? Wood. Uh, wood on half ice. I think there was a, a throw back to the 70s because everything was wood in the 70s, hadn't including quite, like the cars. Hadn't quite moved on. The cars were wood. In hadn't the 70s. quite moved on. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Wood paneling on everything. No. I get like recess trauma because like, you know, load shedding, right? <laughs> right. Like I, like, I, I finally, got, finally got back up. I don't, I don't have load shedding. And for the first time, probably in about 18 months, have I bothered setting the time on my microwave. Oh, yeah. Because as soon as load shedding, it just goes and then it flashes back at 12 oh, yeah, and then no, you know we, a couple of hours, what's the point? Yeah, we've got it on the, the oven. Yeah. And I mean, we don't bother at why, all. Why, why bother? Why bother? So it's the first time in like a couple, in 18 months. But we've months. got a proper analog clock on the wall in the kitchen that we yeah, rely on. I'll see you. That's, well, it's battery. It's a battery operated clock. How novel. That is the only way that we know what the time is in our home. I mean, because your cell phone's dead. Yeah. The stove clock is permanently 12 our, hours out. Our like internal body <laughs> clock's all messed up because we don't know what's going on. It's like light. It's dark. It's like living in Finland. Those countries with six months of darkness. That's so true. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we start to get that. Uh, so this week um, started out, if you're listening on the podcast, uh, thank you for listening on the podcast. Uh, lots of 80s content, That 80s Show SA Facebook. Uh, go give that a like. A few people popping up liking that page again. Um, we started off with Kiss by Prince. Right. Right. And uh, why? Because I want to tell Dory a story. And everyone, everyone can listen. Not just Dory. Everyone oh. can listen. Are you sure? Everyone can listen. Yeah. We could chase them out. And we could. <laughs> it kind of links into a thought that I had this week. What would a podcast hosted by Millie Vanilli sound like? <laughs> oh, no, we're not doing this. Exactly like that. <laughs> exactly like that. Anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Prince was like, he was amorous, right? He was never out, that, but it. I don't think he was in. I think he was just fluid. Yes. Right? I think so. I mean, was, was it just his religious. costume? So, but he's very religious. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it was all an act mm. to sell music okay. and but, get fans. Yeah. Well, look, so this story is um, Prince's attempt to win the heart of the bangle Susanna Hoffs. This popped up a few okay. weeks ago. Yes. Prince trying to win the heart, trying to woo her. Right? Mm -hmm. So it says here, normally if you want to woo someone you with flowers, sweet compliments, lovely gifts. But Prince tried to woo Susanna Hoffs with a song. Okay? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, it says he, he did, he had a, listen, Madonna had a tryst with everyone in the 80s. Yeah. So that, okay, that doesn't really count. I'm not saying, I think that, again, all publicity stunts, I don't think they were real actual relationships. No. 
So Prince, at one point in the 80s, gets enamored, infatuated with Susanna Hoffs. Who can blame him? I mean, you understand. I totally get it, right? So he approached her with a song. He said, I've got a song for you. I'm going to win you over with a song. The story goes, this is told by um, Patricia Cotero. I was friends with Susanna Hoffs, so I gave Prince the tape of the Bangles, Hero Takes a Fall, right? Right. I said, these girls are amazing. They sound like the Beatles. You've got to do something with them. Uh, he loses it. Manic Monday, love it. He said, let's do it. They're amazing. And then, of course, he takes a, f- a, a fancy to Susanna Hoffs, mm. right? To this day, many people who knew the bang- who know the Bangles and the song don't even connect it to Prince. Wait, I've lost the course of the story here, Dory. Okay. Um, am I right, Dory? Yes. I think I've just... The song that Prince gave to Susanna Hoffs was Manic Monday. I don't know. It no. sounds familiar, but maybe. No, wait. So hold on a second. I'm trying to like so scroll did, through did here. So they not write Manic Monday? So you've got to do something with them, right? So Prince replies, hey, what about Manic Monday? So he had written, I thought he heard Manic Monday, fell in love with, this is terrible research, by the way. <laughs> but, well, stock standard, really. So he then had Manic Monday written. Okay. He gives it to them, but he has a song under the pseudonym Christopher. I'm going to fact check you quick. Yeah, he, so he writes the song under the pseudonym Christopher because he doesn't want to take in, uh, uh, credit for it. Okay. So Susanna Hoffs appreciated the gesture, uh, the gesture and saw it as an indicator of his generosity and can't believe that no one ever traced the song back to Prince. I started the story one way and now I've blown my mind. He wrote it. It says the song Manic Monday was written by Prince and was first recorded by Prince in 2019. Well, I mean, they mean that he did it in 2019. What? But wasn't he dead? When did he die? No, he, he's still alive. He's left lots of music for everybody. This okay. is not a great start to the show. I've got to tell everyone. <laughs> no, I'm so... Because I thought this was like, oh, no, he gave some song. He gave the Bangles Manic Monday and didn't take credit for it. The Bangles' Manic Monday, the bright, bouncy song, is one thing that makes us a candidate for best single of the year. A terrific look at the alarm clock blues, blah, 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 blah. Equally yeah. inviting are Susanna Hoff's perfectly tailored vocal and the Bangles' Mamas and Papas inspired harmonies. Prince tried to show his affection for Susanna Hoff's and appreciation for the Bangles mm. by gifting them with a legendary song. Have you heard his version of Manic Monday? Because it says it was released on his posthumous album in 2019. His version of it. A demo version of it. I have not heard that. I mean, sorry, I would not have heard it because I did not read. The, if I'd read the story properly, <laughs> you would have made a plan. What? I mean, because I have not been keeping up with the Prince. posthumous music of Prince. I'll be honest, I haven't. I try to keep up with Susanna Hoffs, which is just so pretty. She's mm. so lovely that then I get so. Okay, let's start this again. Okay. Let's just Prince tried to win the affections of Susanna Hoffs by okay. giving the Bangles. Manic Monday. Manic They're Monday. Huge breakout hit. Massive, massive. To and this day. Yes. How often don't you on a Monday say, it's just another Manic Monday? I wish it was Sunday. That's my fun day. I say it all the time. <laughs> I said it this Monday. Mm-hmm. I'm probably going to say it this coming Monday. If you're listening on a Monday, I said it. Know that Paolo said it today. I said it today. Wow. That is, so, what? I jumped ahead. Why yes. I didn't read the details of the story? You know me, though. Not, mm. not, not much for the details. You're not much for details. Because. I'm not surprised that Prince would fall for Susanna Hoffs because he had a look. Yes. Because he had muses, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Remember his muse, Vanity? Yes. Okay, now Vanity, I know her from The Last Dragon, right? Right. Now, I want to show you Vanity, a picture of Vanity. How Susanna Hoffs looking is Vanity? There's definitely a, like, they could be cousins. Like, I, I know a lot of people in the 80s had big teased hair and the eyebrows and, yeah. and, and the, the, the eye makeup and that. But there is definitely a Susanna Hoffs. If you don't know what Vanity looks like, think of Nicole Schwing, 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 from Pussycat Dolls. Mm-hmm. They're, they could be yes. mother and daughter. Yeah. I take the timeline, right? Absolutely. So that's Vanity. What I did realize in the story is that another one of Prince's muse was somebody called Apollonia. Yes. Do you remember her? I do, of course, yes. I don't remember. Maybe I'll know one of her songs because she would definitely have done the sort of shit that I like. Mm. So that's Apollonia. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that is as if Vanity and Susanna Hoffs had a baby. 
that is her. Yeah, I, I mean, the mechanics of that you know. are bewildering. But So that is now Apollonia. So do, you, pr- do you claim to understand all how DNA works? No, I, I don't. Yes. I, I they could am, be spliced together in a lab. I'm a blonde-haired, light-eyed <laughs> Portuguese person. I <laughs> fucking have no idea <laughs> how genetics and DNA work, right? Um, so Prince definitely had a look. He tried to get together with Susanna Hoffs. And what I do know, even though bad research, how I picked up the story is it was actually posted and uh, somebody put on Twitter when I cared about, how little do you care about Twitter these days? I mean, I'm never on that. That's just the worst. If anybody goes onto my Twitter, all you'll see is the occasional retweet of your tweets about the show. I know. That is it. Well, I stopped promoting the show on Twitter <laughs> because know. what's the point? So now there's going to be absolutely nothing on nothing. my Twitter feed. Nothing. <laughs> so when I did care about Twitter, but I'm mm. sure she did it on social, somebody added Susanna Hoffs, the story, and she said, yes, it's true. That he was, not that, that, that she gave the song, that he yeah. was trying to woo her. So do you think she went, yeah, why not? And like, maybe they had like a one-off thing. Or like do you she think w- she just was like, this is a lovely gesture. Thank you very much. I'm eternally grateful, but no, thanks. Oh, what would you have done? Because here's the thing, we're totally speculating now. Yeah. So Susanna Hoffs was in that movie, right? Yes. The movie where she's in underwear. Don't know. Yeah. The, uh, don't know. Cannot remember the. Cannot title. remember the title. Just Google. One of Paolo's many schlocky, terrible movies. Susanna Hoffs dancing in underwear. That's I all you like need to know. Something about sleepovers. S- could be sleepover. Could be night over. Could be sleep out. Something like something that. Something like that. She was right. in her underwear. Her mother produced and directed that movie. Yes. Puts your daughter in the underwear. So we definitely got very stage mom, momager, Kardashian mom vibes. Mm-hmm. Do you get that, Jenna? What's a, that? The mom. Yes. So, and Susanna Hoffs was very young. She was like 19, 20, very, very young. Mm -hmm. Her mom would have said, meet the guy. Go to his house, jump in the little red Corvette, go see what's happening. And then hopefully she would have said, because she seems together. And she said, no, I'm not not into this. Yeah. You know, Hmm. this is speculation. We need to interview Susanna Susanna Hoffs and and ask. We need to find the story. Video interview only. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Dory, I'll be a like I'll be like you when we interviewed Gary Kemp. I, I'd be like myself when you interviewed Thomas Anders, to be fair. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think that's a better example. <laughs> uh, go back on where we found this podcast. Go back uh, for some of our interviews. Uh, Thomas Anders, Gary Kemp, Katrina and the Waves. Um, I think it was the anniversary of the t- 35 year of Walking on Sunshine released the other day. So go yeah. back and listen to our podcast with uh, Katrina. From Katrina and the Waves, shameless self-promotion. Okay, so just to sum up, started a story in one way yes. and just uncovered that Prince gave the Bengals Manic Monday. I feel like this is something I knew at some point and forgot. I know. Also, also, it, it does have those vibes. This show is going to become even worse than it is because we're going to keep forgetting stuff now that we get older. I'm, star- I'm really <laughs> starting to feel that, do <laughs> I'm really starting to feel this absolute devilry. I just hope that our listeners are as geriatric as us and are also forgetting everything we've ever said on the show. Guaranteed. Like they're going, have you heard this new show about the (laughs) 80s? Where can I find it? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. So, yeah. But anyway, Hmm. fun story. If that's the first time you're hearing that, which I very much doubt is the first time we're hearing that. No, it's probably not. Um, and if you want some more useless 80s facts, later in the show we're playing uh, Two 80s Truths and a Lie. Ah. Yeah. So that would have been a great one for Two 80s Truths and a Lie. It would have. Oh, God damn it. If I'd read the story properly. You know. I would have put it all together. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Anyway, here's another truth. Yes. Do you know the game Roblox? No. Are you aware of it in any, any point? Um, I've heard of it. But, you hmm. know, I'm not... I, I don't know what it is, but I do know what it is, if you know what I mean. I know what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, it's a thing in the peripheral of my brain. Yeah. It's a thing that exists. But I've never we, actually, we work in media, so we hear no, things no. Yeah, in the background. But I don't actually know, know what. Like, if you were to say to me, describe it to me, I'll be like, I can't. So, wh- when tech bros say to you, the metaverse, <laughs> I'm like, Roblox, the metaverse, what are you talking about, right? So, it's, it's a game, it's an online game, it's a whole world. And uh, it's free to play and it's cross-platform for people okay. who care about stuff like that. Okay. So I can play on my phone, I can play on a console, I can play on a computer, yeah. and it's all the same. Is it like Sims? Because I have a 15-year-old, I kind of understand how The Sims works. But beyond that, I don't know much about gaming. It's, it's in a Sim ballpark. Okay. So you go into a world, you get jobs, you earn things like Roblox, 
Roblox, Roblox, Robux. Ro- Robux? Could, sound, could be that, E-Bucks, I don't know. <laughs> It's all as equally worthless. Okay. Um, Does it look like Minecraft? It's not as blocky as Minecraft. Okay. So, but it's kind of animated, right? It's not yeah. like. No, it's not. It's not like uh, it, like you, you're supposed not, to look like people. You like little avatar. I want to show you. They, they kind of, you know, Lego minifigures. Yes. And then you know Playmobil. Yes. The kind of fake Lego. Yeah. Well, not the fake Lego. The different. I actually think Playmobil was really cool. I love Playmobil. Yeah. Have I ever shown you my Playmobil uh, Back to the Future DeLorean? No. Oh, what the, where have I been? <laughs> I got that. Okay. Next up, the Playmobil Michael Knight and Kit. Oh, my goodness. And then after that, I've got to get the A-Team van. Playmobil make these things. They make these things for... They make these things for adults. Like lo- you. Losers like me. They're like, how do we make even more money than we're already making yeah. off the kids? Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, yes. Geeks. Geeks. <laughs> Geeks. So... In Roblox, you look like a bit of a Lego man in a Playmobil person's body. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of what you look like. Got it. But you get jobs, there's concerts, even like there's brands in Roblox. You can go to Starbucks Okay. and use your Robux to Roblox to buy a Capo Bucks. Capo G- <laughs> what? You know what I'm saying. So you get it. There's concerts. Okay. Right. And there's Rick Astley. So this crosses over into the real world somehow. So, well, yes, it's metaverse. It's all right. it's all the same. It's avatars. And there's Rick Astley. So okay. Rick Astley played Roblox for charity and doesn't let us down. So that's what a little Roblox person looks like. Okay, okay got well, it, yeah. You'll, you'll find this, this AD Show SA Facebook page. Oh, next to an ad for soccer boots. Now I'm distracted. <laughs> and um, so he had this live stream for charity, went online with this like a big Roblox online player. Yeah. And he played Roblox with this kid. Uh, As any random kid? No, this kid is a person. Like a, is he like a YouTuber type? He's a YouTuber. His name's one of those gaming YouTubers. Creekcroft. Oh, that that means nothing to me, but it might mean something to lots of teenagers. That's his name. And apparently it wasn't the first time. They often get together and Rick Astley plays Roblox with this guy. Okay. Um, They did it for Comic Relief, Donations, Charities website. (sighs) You can play Roblox with some dickhead kid. Can't talk to us, Rick Astley. I mean... I'm not hating on Rick Astley. No, that's impossible. Oh, by the way, there was a little Roblox Rick Astley in this. So if you watch the video, we'll put the link that Eddie shows her Facebook page. There's a little Rick Astley running around. Is he doing the... Yeah, in in his never going to give you up little... Okay. Get up. His little outfit. His famous raincoat that Mm. he lost at a concert. That he lost at a concert, striped shirt. Um, Cool. Yeah. So that's Rick Astley playing Roblox... Did Prince give him Roblox? <laughs> Goes to Prince helped him out of that. Uh, so, Dory, listen, something weird been happening in our movie recommendations the past few weeks. Why? There haven't been any. Because <laughs> you you outsourced yours. Not to chat GPT, but to Dom PT. No, no, no. That, not this week. Okay. Not this week. Okay, so Dory I have, outsourced. I have I have a movie. Oh. I have a movie. I, I, am, I am planning to outsource a movie to Dom. Because I don't think I can handle it. The movie? Yeah. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss it. Ho- hopefully next week, actually, we'll okay. discuss it. Because it's a movie I want to talk about, but I don't want to watch because it might scar me forever. Yeah, and I imagine that's why you would outsource to Dom. I mean, that's why last time I outsourced the that that TV series, that um, Under the Mountain, that traumatized my whole childhood to him. Because I didn't want to go back into it. Of course. Right. By outsourcing it to him, we still went back into it, but I didn't have to actually watch it. Okay. So there is a movie that has I've become aware of. In fact, I've actually been aware of it for a while, but I became recently more aware of it. But we'll get into it when I speak to Dom. And I thought, okay, I now have to watch this. And then I thought, no, I don't want to watch this. I know someone who has definitely watched this. And I was right. It's one of his favorite movies because he loves all the disturbing Gross things yeah. that have ever been made for screen. That's his thing. We still need to talk to him about his career as a child star. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we'll get him on. We'll get him okay. on. And uh, that's when I'm going to outsource. But I made a, a big effort, Paolo, oh, thank to you, last Dory. night watch something that has been on my list for a very long time. Because it's it's come up on the show multiple times. And every time it's come up, I've said, I don't know if I've watched that. And you went, What? What? Don't be, and then I was like, maybe I've watched it, but I don't remember it. So I was like, right, let me put this to bed once and for all. 
And that is a big clue as to what this movie is. But let me put this issue to bed and watch this movie and figure out if I've seen it before. And either way, I'm going to talk about it. I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever seen this movie before, before last night, which is crazy. Is it a well-known? It is such a well-known 80s movie. It is one of the quintessential 80s movies. I'll give you another clue. Earlier you were talking about Susanna Hoffs when she was young, possibly being exploited and, you know, pushed to do things when she was young. There is a star of this movie that was potentially in the same position, maybe even two stars of this movie who were potentially in the same position. This movie has so many famous people in it. A lot of it, uh, for a lot of them, this was their first role. Oh. You would have had this movie on Sony Betamax or VHS and one particular scene would have been played over and over and over again so that the tape would have stretched to the point where it was unwatchable. If I say the words... No, no, I know. I know what you're talking about. Does it involve red bikini? <laughs> it does. Oh, there, there we are. We got it. You got it. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I am, of course, talking about Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I finally watched it. That is unreal <laughs> that you have never watched that movie. You know, there's there's one scene where, where the, the teacher, Mr. Hand, writes his name on the board and introduces himself to the class. One of my favorite characters, yeah, by yeah. the way. And I thought, oh, my God, that's so familiar. Maybe I have seen this movie. But that is the only part that is familiar to me of the whole film. So but, I must have just seen a clip at some but point. No, I think it's like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yes. That it has been parodied, parodied so much. Yes, maybe that's so it. So much over the past 30 odd years. Because that scene That you feel you've seen it. But no other, well, obviously the red bikini scene, obviously, because that's been done to death. <sighs> but outside no, of those no, no, two no, no. scenes. No. I think it's still got a lot of life left in it. So I watched this movie last night with my 15 year old, whose only concern was, how old were these girls when this movie was made? Okay. That was the only concern. You know what? My answer to that, older than me when I watched it. <laughs> I did look it up. They were of age. But it's so th- which makes age. us feel good now. But the thing is, they were older than me when I watched it. So it was fine. Right. It was. Look, there is a lot of stuff in that movie that has not aged well. The usual, what you would expect, um, gay slurs. Sure. The usual. Sure. But other than that, it actually surprised me because I was expecting it to be completely dumb. And parts of it were very dumb. I mean, Sean Penn's character is a caricature of himself, honestly. It's, it's too over the top. And, and it's so weird seeing him now because Sean Penn has actually like low-key not aged. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it just well, looks... he looks better now, for sure. It, it, because he had that weird blonde... Yeah. I mean, I assume it was his real hair then. Yeah. I love that character because he was a skater. He was... I don't quite understand why he... I don't understand the stoned part. But he was just. I don't know how he dude, got through high school. I mean, he literally didn't seem to do any work, so yeah, it doesn't make sense. But yeah. well, yeah. we only had a snapshot of their lives. You know, he could have like he could have got his shit together. I got my shit together the last six months of school, right? You know, and and passed. I got out. Yes. <laughs> anyway, going back to the fact that my fifteen-year-old watched this movie with me, they did actually enjoy it, but specifically, so it's multiple storylines. If you haven't seen it, like mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. It's multiple storylines that kind of weave together in this very silly high school, a year in the life of these high school kids, which I'm going to get to now. And I thought it was going to be completely silly, but some of the storylines are better than others. My kid loved the the Sean Penn storyline because it was the funniest. It was like, he was an over-the-top ridiculous story. You're going to have to remind me. You're going to have to remind me of what that storyline was. He was just this ridiculous stoner kid who kept disrupting the class with Mr. Hand, Mr. Hand being the old guy, history teacher. And, I mean, he he either wouldn't be in class because he'd be late, or the one day he is in class early, and the teacher looks very surprised as to what the hell's going on because this kid's – and he's sitting up straight, looking all attentive in class, right. like he's listening and paying attention, but he's got this little smile on his face. And the next thing, there's a knock at the door, and a pizza's getting delivered to him, and he's ordered a pizza to be delivered to him <laughs> during class. Because he's just he's just full of shenanigans. He is shenanigan guy. He's shenanigan Stoner guy. Shenanigan guy. He's shenanigan guy. Shenanigan. Yeah, Stoner yeah. shenanigan yeah. guy. Yeah. So he's Swallow funny. Him. You know, he is funny. But um, of course the most famous. Okay, so the most famous thing, Phoebe Cates, I actually watched an interview that she did with David Letterman not long after the movie came out. And 
she was, I think, 19 mm-hmm. when the movie was filmed, and she is supposed to be 16 or 17 in the movie. Yeah. And yes, there's that one. It's very brief, the, the, the nudity scene, actually. It's quite brief. Whereas you actually see more of a naked Jennifer Jason Lee in the movie. Okay. She's in more, more naked scenes. Yeah, yeah. She was 20 at the time, I think, but she really looked young. I mean, she looked 14. Well, they all, crazy. yeah, they all they looked look, like yeah, very young. Very young yeah. I, opposed to like normal high school movies where they're yeah. evidently 35. <laughs> <laughs> like the video you posted on our <laughs> Facebook page, which was hilarious. Um, but in the in the interview with David Letterman, he asks her, in a, oh my God, it's the most awkward interview you've ever seen in your life. Because he's asking her about, you know, but, the, the nudity. But you know what? David Letterman and all those talk show hosts, they were really creepy those days. Oh my God. They were just as creepy as, I mean, I suppose it was endemic of Hollywood. They were... They make you feel super uncomfortable because they've taken very young girls, very naive young girls, and yeah. put them in front of someone like David Letterman, who's completely, and Jay Leno and even Conan O'Brien, who I love, they completely lean into it. I mean, she gets into the studio with, Dave, with David Letterman, and he says, I thought Hot Times at Richmond High was a fine film. And the audience packs up laughing. Mm, mm. And it's like, we know what you're saying, yeah, guy. You yeah. know, we know what you're saying. Yeah. Anyway, so he he very awkwardly asks her about the nudity. And she says she felt very comfortable doing the nudity in Fast Times, whereas she was in a movie two years earlier when she was 17, where she did more nudity. And she felt very uncomfortable in that movie, a movie called Paradise, which sounds familiar and I might have seen it. I don't know, but make a note. Para- it's called Paradise. Paradise. <laughs> Phoebe. Okay, yes. yes. I was 17. I can't watch it now because I, I didn't watch That's it when so I was creepy. young. That that now so it's creepy, creepy if you watch it now. Now it's creepy. Anyway, I kind of went down the rabbit hole trying to find out more about this movie. And it is written by Cameron Crowe, yep. who is famous for many great films. Mm. I mean, Jerry Maguire, one of my favorite films. And, and it's quite weird because the other movies that, that Cameron Crowe did are very unlike Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So here's the story, right? Okay. He went undercover at a high school yes. for a year. To write Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So a lot of that stuff is based on true people. Mm. I mean, the character of Mark, I think it is. Right. I think it's Mark. Or, I can't remember. There was a Mark and a Mark. I can't remember which one was who. Is based on an actual real person. And he wrote the story based on these ex- the experiences of these high school kids that he hung out with for a year. So in that way, I suppose it's kind of realistic. But one of the things that came out about it is... What was kind of groundbreaking about it is because this movie came out in 1982. We're talking early 80s. Yeah. And what was kind of groundbreaking about it is that it showed that women were really keen on sex, which at the time was not the norm. It was still a little bit old fashioned yeah. to be a woman who was horny, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. The, there, there's a lot that 80s movie stylized. Yeah. That probably wasn't. So I, I was actually reading this the other day, right? Um, and and it, it, it kind of like all came to my mind because we're re watching the Goldbergs, okay? Right. So everything in the Goldbergs is like super. I know you've never watched the Goldbergs. It, it's, it's, I will eventually. It blows my mind that you've never watched the Goldbergs. I'll try to get to it. But anyway. Maybe once you've watched The Princess Bride. Just for all the cameos, the 80s people that mm. pop up in the Goldbergs as yeah. characters. I mean, no, I'll make an effort. Steve, I will. Steve Gutenberg. I know the you principal. love Steve. I know. becomes the principal. I mean, come on. So th- everything they wore was very over the top, and our mind of the 80s was very over the top. And the, I, I read something in The Guardian. Well, I read The Guardian. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's quite a few shows in uh, coming out in the UK that are set in the 80s. Right. But they're all, they say the problem with, because they want them to be like kind of times realistic, right? They say it's very hard to find era relevant clothing, furniture, etc. because... The 80s didn't look like that. It didn't look mm. like we perceived on TV. It was very actually meh. And eh. while the Goldbergs is relevant, yeah. I'm not talking to you, Dory. I know your I, outfits. Yeah, I had all the, the neon stuff. Why I bring it up with the Goldbergs is yeah. cool. What they do is it's it's a fictionalized story of the the creator's family. And he'll intersperse. Every episode ends with like home videos of his. And if you see how he dressed then, mm. I was like... It's actually right. Nobody really wore that over over the top stuff um, that we saw, except for you. <laughs> Maybe it was a teenager thing. It wasn't just me. No, I'm actually thinking about some the home videos that I saw of some people that I know. That <laughs> okay, so just ignore that whole bit there. <laughs> okay. But but the thing is, what was shown in movies of the '80s was actually not reflective of what pe- people were. Actually, very conservative in the '80s. Right. Actually. 
Well, I mean, I've always noticed when you see actual footage, like especially American footage of the early 90s, it looks more 80s than actual footage from the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what we're perceiving as 80s, bright, big shoulders, big hair, it's actually early 90s in America. They were somehow a little bit behind, I think. I don't know. Yeah, because early 80s is going to be, 70s is still huge in your... Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, for for the early 80s, this is a very 80s movie for the early 80s. But, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of very day-glow things. It's still got quite a 70s vibe, this movie. Yeah, yeah. In fact, especially on the soundtrack. The soundtrack has quite a few 70s things on it. Do you have any songs there? Um, So there was Jackson Brown, Somebody's Baby, which is one of the main songs from from the movie. But I don't want to talk about the songs because I want to talk about the cast. Okay, let's get into it. So obviously you've got your main cast. We've spoken about Phoebe Cates, Jennifer Jason Lee, Sean Penn. There was, did you notice even? Okay, we know that Eric Stoltz made an appearance. He's, he was also one of the stoner kids. He was yeah. Sean Penn's friend. Forrest Whitaker, it was like really? one of his first movies. Anthony Edwards, Goose. From, yes, yes. From Top Gun, also yes. one of the stoner kids. You, he's in it for five seconds and says two words. But I'll tell you who's in it for even less and doesn't say any words is Nicolas Cage. I've ruined it for myself because I just looked here and there he is, Nicolas Cage. So here's the thing with Nicolas Cage. You I'm literally ha- will miss it if you blink. I'm having a bit of a Nicolas Cage moment right now, to be honest. That's Why? Well. So I watched that uh, new movie of his, What the Unbearable Weight of Huge Talent, oh, where he it. plays himself. Okay. Um, and I, for me, he hasn't done anything good since the 90s, honestly. N- no, so I'm watching that. Listen, he's full on Nicolas Cage. And then before that... And now I've started watching Army of One with okay. him and Russell Brand, where he's kind of based on a true story okay. where it's this crazy guy inspired by God to go find Osama bin Laden. Okay. So I'm having a, I'm in a bit of a Nicolas Cage moment. All right. Yeah. So blink, but. Honestly, if, if you blink, you'll miss him. Fast he's times at Richmond High didn't but, have. But, but, if you go onto YouTube and you type in fast times at Richmond High deleted scenes, there are like 20 deleted scenes. Most of them are shit. There's yeah. a reason they were deleted. But there are a couple of scenes where he talks. So he had a speaking role and was cut from the film. Nicolas Cage Young is scary. He is, he does, he looks like, he looks like someone took, like built him. He yeah. doesn't look yeah. normal. Yeah. He looks very, like an old man who's been made young. Very weird looking guy. It, it, it's so bizarre. Because in, in that unbearable weight of massive talent, yeah. Nicolas Cage channels a younger version of Nicolas Cage. So like the really young version that we first would have seen him in, uh, what, the Vampire's Kiss was in that. I mean, we're talking much younger than Vampire's Kiss, yeah. yeah. Much, okay. much younger. Right. Yeah. And But they've now done like, I don't know, CGI or something. Yeah. And it's like, he was really weird when he, weird looking. He, He's a weird he, looking he young guy. He grew into himself for yeah, sure. Yeah. Did you notice, um, okay, so, oh, so sorry, one of the other main characters is Judge Reinhold. Yeah. For me, he just... I think he was miscast. Is, does he have a major role? I don't it's remember. It's a major role. Yeah, he's one of the main storylines. Judge Reinhold was in a lot, though. Uh, for me, he, he was in just a lot. didn't fit this movie at all. Yeah. They, and apparently, Nicolas Cage was originally cast in his role, but Nicolas Cage was young. He was like 17 or something, so legally he couldn't work that many hours. <laughs> it was illegal for him to work that many hours, <laughs> but, so they had to give the role to, the role to Judge Reinhold but, instead. But we can intimate that we're seeing a 16-year-old boobs. Like, I mean... <laughs> I mean, honestly. <laughs> Hollywood. No, really. Anyway, the, the movie's got lots of interesting storylines. There's, there's, you know, the usual, um, you, the girl sleeps with the guy and he ignores her. The girl sleeps with the guy, gets pregnant, has to go have an abortion. I'm hopefully not putting too many spoilers here. But um, the, other, the other cool, interesting little factoid that I found, Cameron Crowe was, was married to Nancy Wilson from Hot. You know the band Hot? Yes. And she has a cameo in the movie. Oh, nice. There's a part where Judge Reinhold, he's working for this terrible restaurant chain. He's got this terrible pirate un- like uniform that he has to wear. And he's in the car delivering food. And this gorgeous woman pulls up next to him in like this red Corvette type thing, you know, like a, some, sort of, some sort of convertible. And she like smiles at him, but then she sees his uniform and kind of like okay. makes a face and, and drives off. That was Nancy Hart. He put her in as like a cameo. I would never even recognize. I would ne- I'd no, I didn't. I would not have known yeah. if, it, if I hadn't read it. Did you ever see? So this, this I didn't know. They made a TV series spinoff. Yes. Of Fast Times. But it was like Fast Times. Yes. 
And can, can I, is this the one? No, no, I'm thinking of the Ferris Bueller TV spinoff that lasted one episode of Jennifer Aniston. Okay, so listen to this. The film inspired a short-lived 1986 television series titled Fast Times. Okay. So the, the two teachers, the famous was, teachers. Were they at Ridgemont High? Or just, it's just I don't okay, know. Okay, right. So the, the, the two teachers, so Mr. Hand and then there was also the science teacher. Um, I can't remember his name. They both came, oh, sorry, Do, uh, Mr. Vargas. So they both came back as the, in their roles as Mr. Hand and Mr. Vargas. And the other, characters were, the other characters were played by all different actors. Most notably, Patrick Dempsey played one of the main roles. I remember that. I have not seen this. That is a fact I do remember. But I'm sure, I mean, it says short-lived. Mm, three so episodes. I don't know how many episodes there were. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why do that? Yeah. Cash grab. Well, who knows, eh? Paolo, I'm going to ask a question. If this movie had not had the nudity, would it be as famous as it is? That is a very good question. I think the, the cost, so not for nothing, but somehow Phoebe Cates came into my consciousness the other day. Mm -hmm. Because she's in something. She's in something new. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, she's in... Or maybe I saw her in the Goldbergs, but I don't know. <laughs> but she's in something new. And I was like, I'm sure that's Phoebe Cates. I'm, I'm she's also aged very well. Yeah, right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm convinced that is Phoebe Cates. And it was Phoebe Cates. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, oh, I have to Google that scene and I have to watch it. Right. But I For think... Research. I think because... The cast was really good. So even though they were young, no, they were they, they were really good. It was a, a, a it was a highly enjoyable film. I think it's become iconic because of the nudity, and mm. I yes, I think it would still have been as famous just because of how many famous people were in it. It made a lot of money. It was not a box office mm. flop. It was hugely successful. Like when it was released, mm. there is no way in hell that it was released in its full form here in South Africa. It would have been cut to pieces mm. so if we had gone to see it if we were old enough to have gone to see it on the big screen here we would not have seen any boobs i'm yeah. telling you now no yeah. not a chance i remember watching movies with a lot of boobs really? i what you know what movie i watched with a lot of boobs the other day twins really yeah well, they're all on schwarzeneggers <laughs> but um yeah i watched a lot of movies you could be right you could be, so was it popular yeah then because the nudity would have know. been taken out i don't know we don't know. We can't go back that far back no, in time. I can't think back. I mean, I would have been nine in 1982. Yeah. yeah. Good movie. Good coming of age movie. Eight. Actually. I can't believe you've never watched it. Well, now I have, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I did. Good for you, I'm Dora. glad I did. Good for you. Um, so, can I hop into my movie? Yes. Let's do it. Um, Dan Aykroyd. Okay. Dan Aykroyd movie. Uh. So many shenanigans. Oh, of course. It's all a shenanigans. Mm. So Dan Aykroyd plays this character. He's going to go to jail. Con man. Okay. He's going to go to jail. And somehow he cons him. He says, listen, I can't be in jail. I'm mentally unwell. you got to put me in a psychiatric institution. Okay. And he somehow convinces them. So he goes into a psychiatric institution and takes over the place. Right. Everyone, all the patients revere him. He runs the place. Right. Literal inmates in charge of the asylum. Right. Runs the place. There's a secondary story of a actual psychologist who now has a breakdown. Okay. Right. And he's like, no, no, I need, I'm actually going to check myself in to, I just need, I'm having a breakdown. Who, who, who's that? Who's that played by? So that is played by Charles Grodin. Okay. Right. Also in this movie, Walter Matthau. Okay. Okay. So... In the way only 80s shenanigans and mistaken identities can happen is as the proper psychologist is checking in, Dan Aykroyd is pulling his shenanigans, there's some confusion mm. and they think the one's the other. Because mm -hmm. they look so alike. Of course they do. Uh, but the, well, you see, this is the thing. This is the thing you have to do when you watch 80s movies today. Mm. You can't apply today's fact that we have mini computers on us all the time yes so you can't just google somebody you can't just phone somebody no because so even listen even in the 80s you kind of got to go so much could have been solved with a phone call mm -hmm. so much could have been solved with google right yeah. this movie would not exist that there was no google so the movie no. can exist you didn't also, know what people looked like no no idea also in the 80s shenanigans right right 80s movies needed shenanigans there are no shenanigans now yeah when last did you watch a movie with shenanigans we're, um, we're too cynical. Only 80s movies. 
We're too cynical. I know. You can't have shenanigans. It's so sad. Right? I miss shenanigans. I love shenanigans. Right? I wish there was a bar called shenanigans. Mm. I'd go there. I'd have a beer. An Irish bar. Make shenanigans. Shenanigans. <laughs> that is... I'm telling you right now, there's... Sean Hannigans. I went to school with him, I think. <laughs> there's at least 60 of those around the world. At least. Okay. <laughs> but that's the thing. You've right. got to add shenanigans. Dory even did a big old belly laugh there. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh at myself. That's a good joke. Yeah. Sean Hannigans. Right. So this, the proper psychologist, he actually was on his way to go do a radio show. So he'd been booked to do a radio show. Okay. Right. Like Frasier style. Yes. Now Dan Aykroyd goes. Right. But now Dan Aykroyd goes on the show and he is just like says it as it is. Blunt. Blunt. Like there's no like filters. No manner. Nothing. Just very blunt. Yeah. Of course he becomes a huge hit. Of course. When he arrives in LA, he meets Walter Metau. Walter Metau is a, uh, a, bit of, uh, a homeless person. Okay. And he now thinks the world is ending, dresses up as a priest and now Dan Aykroyd goes, well, you're brilliant. So you're going to stay with me. We're going to be friends and because we need shenanigans. Right. right. And Dan Aykroyd becomes a huge hit, huge success, becomes the number one radio star. Is he, but is he still using the fake name? Still uses the fake name. Pretends and he's the fake doctor. Nobody knows. Because the other guy's still in the loony the bin. Because the other guy's in the loony bin. Oh. And then he keeps telling everyone in the loony bin, that's... That guy's taking. And everyone's like, "Well, you're in the loony bin, of course you're wrong. You're having a you're having a breakdown. You're deluded." The movie's called The Couch Trip. Oh my god! I don't think I've ever watched it, but I so remember seeing it in the vi in the video shop for years. Yes, I always saw the cover. Yes, is of, it like them lifting up the couch or something? There or is a, that one. Yes, and there's also one of all the main characters wrapped together in a straitjacket. Oh my god! That really that just gave me a nostalgia shot to the heart. But I don't think I ever watched it. Well, you would have been one of many because despite the actors, yeah, it, it was, was one of those flop at the cinema, mm. but huge on home video. Right. I mean, there's so many movies yeah, like that. It sounds fun. Yeah, it's just, it's a romp. It's yeah. a romp. It's shenanigans. And uh, the radio station manager, right, yeah. he's a real put upon character, just like every radio station manager. And if you know radio station managers, <laughs> oh my God, play the world's <laughs> smallest violin for them. Because they are the most, like, the whole world is, uh, am I right? I'm not saying anything okay. to protect my safety okay. in work. Yeah. Radio station <laughs> managers, just, let's just all feel sorry for them. And uh, now this guy, because of this no holds barred show, he's not going to manage yeah. Dan Aykroyd. So you got to tone it down. This is their reaction kind of like in the, the, the call screeners booth, what we call them yeah. in the biz, right? So yeah. you've got Dan Aykroyd in the main studio, and then there's the call screeners booth where yeah. now all the producers and everyone sits. Oh, well, like where Roz sat in Frasier. There, there you go. Yeah. A, a not dissimilar set. Yeah. Not yeah. dissimilar set. Right. Um, here is now, after Dan Aykroyd has just done his first show, mm. and now the radio station manager plus the executives of the radio station are now discussing. There are some swears. Okay. But they are funny. Apparently Baird can. Well, he said, balls, asshole, son of a bitch, and finally fuck. We're okay on balls, we're iffy on son of a bitch, and even asshole is somewhat anatomically potentially forgivable. There's no getting around fuck. Put upon radio station manager. So um, that is my movie, The Couch Trip. Not as culturally relevant as Fast Times at Ridgemont High. But probably as enjoyable. Less nudity, though. Oh, Less nudity. Well, I mean, if all you're coming for is the nudity, watch my movie. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly one scene. I mean, they No, made... there is another scene with Jennifer Jason Lee. I mean, really nude. No. Like... That, but but you know what? It's actually the tease of the Phoebe Cates scene. Yes. No, it's the way it's done. Slow motion. It's slow motion. And, and it is. I was just, while you're busy talking about it, I actually Googled it. It is one of the most paused scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and there was actually a problem in video so that people would get that the cassette tape back. And it would just be stretched. It would just be stretched. Point, it would just be ruined, damaged. They made a joke I mean, about it in Stranger Things. And probably the cover all sticky and just not nice. Ooh, that's disgusting, But Dory. yet probably true. Yeah, very true. Uh, <laughs> very true. That's one of the things, you see. Boys are gross. Boys are gross. <laughs> and I didn't want to get, I was going to say something about like online and I used sticky phone screens, <laughs> like magazines stuck together. It's like, that's another thing no one will get. Jokes about magazines get stuck together. Yeah. No one else will get that anymore. It's not no. a joke you can make anymore. 
So sad. Is it a joke we ever should have made? Mm. Um, so listen, if you're listening to this live on a Friday morning, Andrew Ridgely was just on BBC One. Okay. Right, he was just talking wham things on BBC One. As soon as we've done the show, we're going to go back. We're going to listen for the latest Andrew Ridgely news, but the latest George Michael news. The the race is hotting up for induction into the 2023 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. The votes close in May. You can get on this. We can all vote as just a normal person. Yeah. Right? I remember voting last year. Vote this year. Vote this year, Dory. It's unreal. We spoke about this a while ago, but we'll bring it up again. It's unreal that some of these people are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. Right. The top five uh, candidates to let me let me read some of the others that aren't in that's in the running. Joy Division. Eh. No, Dory. <laughs> Their impact on music, just how yeah. they modern music. Okay, fine. Rage Against the Machine. Uh, I mean, a tribe called Quest. Can I kick it? Yes, you can. He's a kind of niche, though. Okay, Willie Nelson. Okay, I, I, I say yes to Willie. He's not in. And then the top five to get voted in now. Soundgarden, take it or leave it. Iron Maiden. I say yes. Warren Zevon. Eh. <laughs> he's third in the voting. Okay. I'm reading the top five now. Okay. He's third favorite. He's third in the voting. Cindy Lauper. I mean, come on. Yes. Yes, right. And she's not in. And uh, then obviously the race is on George Michael. It looks like he's getting in this year. Into the Rock and Roll Hall I of mean, Fame. I mean, that is way overdue. No, of course. Of course, you don't think George Michael when you hear the words rock and roll. You you think soul when you think George Michael. But it's faith. But I mean, this whole thing—it's n- none of them is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely faith. Although that's maybe more folk rock, pop, mm. folk very pop, technical. Pop. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the point is, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has for a very long time not been about pure rock and roll, so it's fine. Oh, a Tribe Called Quest. I yeah, mean, exactly. Yeah, exa- exactly. Um, Willie Nelson, not so rock and roll. Get on there and vote. That is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Get your, let's just make Let's put the link on our Facebook page. We'll put the link on because here's the thing. Everyone assumed, of course, last Christmas will be Christmas number one. Of course. So no one votes for it. Are and we going to have that again this year? It happens think? every year because everyone goes, well, of course, this is the year. No mm-hmm. one votes. So I'd love Cindy Lauper to be in, but I want George Michael in first. So how many do they choose? I think those five that I named go in. Okay. But you get the like honor, uh, the honored one. Yeah. George yeah. Michael will be the honored one. Right. Listen, I, 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 Dory, as the beginning of the show told you, I don't read the details. Right. Right. I just, I just look at it snapshot. Right. We've only got an hour. We've only got an hour. Um, going to play two 80s truths and a lie. I said last time I'm going to make a little bit of music for this, but I haven't. Oh, well, you know. Oh, well. Too busy working on my lies, right? So what I do every week is, or every time we play, I give, I stole this, stole old radio concept. Yeah. I give three factoids. Two are true, one is a lie. Dory has to identify which. <sighs> okay. I'm ready. I've put one in that I know you've been busy lately, so I don't think you're going to catch me out on this one. Okay. Okay. In 1987, 20% of all mattress sales were waterbeds. The waterbed market in the 80s was worth $2 billion. Did you ever see anyone with a waterbed? I once went, I think it was a friend of my dad's. I remember going to somebody's house in mm. the 80s and they had a waterbed yeah. and I was so excited was, to lie on it. It's amazing. But yeah, but how do you sleep on it? They sucked. The how concept. Do you, I mean, it's amazing as an idea yeah. and it's fun to lie on for a minute. How the hell do you sleep on that every night? I mean, you because you're sloshing around the sound. I mean, you're just gonna vomit on yourself. If you get seasick in your sleep, like after weeing on yourself constantly. <laughs> Again. Also, I always think of that scene in Edward Scissorhands when yep. I think of a waterbed. Yeah, like just w- without fail. So stupid. Like Dora and I want a lot of things from the '80s back. Waterbeds. No. Keep them. No. Waterbeds are for like kinky motels. What like yeah. novelty motels? That's what a waterbed is for. Do you know what's worse than a waterbed, actually? A jacuzzi. Oh, God. No, that's, I didn't think that went through. <laughs> air mattresses. Air mattress. No, but an air mattress is a practical thing. No, they're not. Because after three hours, you're on the floor. Just <laughs> you sleep on the floor. I don't know what kind of air mattress you've slept on. I've slept on one in a, for really? a while and it was not on the floor. Really? Yeah. Okay, maybe I just keep getting duds. 
But mm. so anyway, that's the first factoid. Truth or lie? Ah, you don't have to name now. Sounds them. legit. Twenty percent of all mattress sales were waterbeds. Twenty percent. That mm. means every time for every ten mattresses they sold, two were waterbed. I mean, it sounds legit, but let me hear the others. Right. Initially, Yoda from uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. Empire Strikes Back, is initially called Buffy. That sounds not legit. That's the second one. And uh, what, two of your favorites, Simon Le Bon mm -hmm. and Jason Bateman, mm. revealed that they worked on a cover of Hungry Like the Wolf that was going to be in Teen Wolf 2. Ugh. I mean, that doesn't sound legit either. Two 80s truths and a lie. So <laughs> The only one that sounds legit is the waterbed, which I'm thinking that's the one that's not true. <laughs> so 20% of all mattress sales were waterbeds. Yoda was initially called Buffy, and Simon Le Bon and Jason Bateman did Hungry Like the Wolf cover for Teen Wolf 2. Teen Wolf 2? Not 2, not the number yes. 2. Teen Wolf 2? Yeah. Gr the grammar is killing Dory. Oh. Grammatically terrible. <laughs> So which one is the lie? The Yoda one is so ridiculous, I'm going to assume it's true, even though it's so ridiculous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to assume it's true. So now it's between the other two. The waterbeds and Jason Bateman, Simon Le Bon. <sighs> hmm. I'm going to guess that the waterbeds is true. <laughs> I was worried if I was going to get caught. Yes, waterbeds is true. Yoda was initially called Buffy in early drafts. Simon Le Bon and Jason Bateman did not work on a cover version of Hungry Like the Wolf or Teen Wolf 2. Yeah, the only reason I thought maybe it's not true is because Simon Le Bon was British and it wasn't often that the British and the Americans did things together in the 80s. That's, ah. That was like my only thing. I was like, mm, that's... That's mm, what makes me But they were this. big in the US. They were probably yeah. living in LA. They were probably living in the uh, LA. It's possible. In 1988, they were living in LA by then. Maybe. Anyway, it didn't happen. So. so why I thought you'd bust me was because Simon Le Bon is on Smartless on the latest episode of Smartless. Oh, I see, I'm not up to date. See, that's what I, that's what I counted. That's what I factored And Jason in. was like, oh, Simon, it's so nice to finally meet you. No, Yes. Uh, so if you're Smartless. What uh, did you listen? Um, I've been listening. <gasps> I haven't listened to that full episode. I haven't listened to the Simon Le Bon one yet. I haven't listened to Keanu Reeves. Smartless podcast, Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, and uh, Sean, Hayes. Sean Hayes. I was going to say Patrick Hayes. And Sean Hayes. And each week, yeah. one of them brings in a guest that the other two don't know. Yeah, well, don't know about. Don't know about. They, know they, them. they know yeah. them, but they don't know they're going to be on. Maybe not. And them. Will Arnett brought Simon Le Bon on. Oh, and, um, I will listen as soon as possible. I am currently on. No, I, I think that is actually next on my list because I just finished the one before. Yeah, so I, which I cannot think. Who I factored right in. I thought I thought if you've listened to that episode, I'm busted. But no. when you when I you said you've been Nothing very busy, busy this week, yeah, I knew that you wouldn't have listened to it. Not yet. Um, so that listen, put that. I'm also trying to go back and listen to older episodes. I know because there's so many, numerous. So do yourselves a favor after you've listened to this podcast. We're almost done. Yeah, smartless. Jason yeah. Bateman, you'll love him. Honestly, do yourself a favor. You'll love him. It's so fun. Yeah, my favorite yeah. right now. So this has been that 80 show. Um, started off rocky, very rocky with me not reading <laughs> facts and, and uh, the Prince story, but uh, Prince giving Manic Monday to try woo Susanna Hoffs, mm -hmm. not winning and then just creating vanity in his lab. That I, imag I imagine Prince had the bat cave that he danced in the bat dance right. under his house. And that's where he created vanity and Apollonia. Um, everything we speak about today or spoke about today can be found that 80 show essay on Facebook. Dory, anything stood out for you today? Great I mean, show, by the way. Really fun. Really fun. What stood out for me today? I mean, apart from your badly researched attempt at talking about Susanna Hobbs. Very bad. And the fact that we probably did know that fact. Yeah. <laughs> just no, we, we, we definitely knew it. <laughs> No, I mean, I, well, I mean, the fact that you've actually listened to Smartless surprises me because I tell you to do things and you never listen. So that was cool. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> this has been That 80 Show. That 80 Show essay on Facebook. Thanks for joining me, Dory. Goodbye. Bye.